Well, good morning. Uh, I am so thankful to be here. Um, my name is Willie Tryon, like Kurt said, so um, I, I'm, I'm pastor at Forge Christian Church in Hastings, and while you may argue that I am strange, I am not a stranger, uh, because you guys have been a part of the plant at Forge uh, before we even hit the ground. Uh, the, the group of churches that had a desire to see a church plant in Hastings uh, included this church right here, and so you guys are a part of our story. Um, you guys have had a heart for church planting, um, but even before Forge with Connection. And so I'm just very thankful to be here. It's interesting, I actually met Doug well before I planted here because when I was a youth pastor in Griswold, Doug was actually the worship pastor in Atlantic, Iowa, which was just about 30 minutes away from us. So I actually met Doug um, three, three years or so before uh, he even moved out here. So it was a very interesting way. God seems to work in those kind of circumstances. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm so glad to be here today. We're going to dive into a message. This morning I got to share a little bit about uh, Forge and the things that are going on there. Today and this time we're not going to necessarily um, dive into any of that. So if you have questions about what's going on at Forge, how you can get involved, um, I'll be around. I'd love to talk to you some more about that. I am going to brag. Well, we shouldn't. you can't say brag. So we're going to share some stories today as well about some of the things that, that are going on at Forge. Um, but we're going to focus in on some scripture this morning. And so if you're at home watching, uh, I do notice there are some seats available. So feel free to come on in and join us Sunday morning. Um, and I know Doug's faking it. So it's been fun run, rummaging through his office while he's been gone. So that's always a good thing. Um, but I, I appreciate Doug so much in allowing me to be here. And we set this up before he got sick. So uh, I... Uh, I'm just really glad to be here. So before I dive into Scripture, I want to just take a moment uh, and pray. I know that we just got done praying, but it feels like a good time to do it. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. <clears throat> My prayer this morning is very simple. And Father, that is, let nothing keep us from worship this morning. Not just songs we sing, but to be able to come and see you and who you are and realize the praise that you are worthy of. Father, as I come to bring this message, I pray that you speak through me. Father, that uh, you use my weakness. And anything that I've missed, Father, I pray that you supplement. I pray that uh, all the things that you don't want me to say, you, you hold back. But Father, that this word pierces our hearts and so calm our minds for maybe the things that uh, we've struggled with this week. All the the things that are going around that we're worried about, allow those to just fade away for this time so that we can hear what you have to teach us. We invite you into this place to take control of this service, and Father, we just lift that up now. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Like I said, my name is Willie, and I'm pastor of Forge, and this morning we're going to be in Matthew 21, so if you have a Bible or on your tablet or whatever, and you want to turn there, that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time. It seems kind of an odd place, maybe, to, as we're getting ready for Thanksgiving, to look at the triumphal entry, but I'm a rule breaker, and so that's what we're going to do. In church planning, you kind of have to be a little bit of a rule breaker, or so that's our excuse, and uh, so we're going to do that. But this morning, uh, before we kind of dive into our piece of Scripture, I, wa I want to ask you guys a question. This is rhetorical. Sometimes I have to say that because sometimes you have people that feel like they want to answer. Uh, so we don't have to answer right now. But this is rhetorical. But here's the question, simply this. What did it take to get you here today? What did you have to do in order to walk through those doors this morning? I want you to think about that. And if you're at home today, um, maybe what kept you? For Doug, he's pretending to be sick, so we already know that answer. But maybe for some of you others that are out there that aren't here, what kept you from coming today? Matthew 21 is a triumphal entry. We normally talk about this right before Easter, Palm Sunday. But today, as we get ready for Thanksgiving, uh, we want to dive through this because I, I want to see a couple of things here. And so we're going to read most of this. And so in Matthew 21, it says this. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus 
sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. So Jesus, this is right towards the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. And he's coming into the town to, to get ready for the feast. And he simply is telling them what's going to happen. He's, he's really getting to, ready to make a grand entrance. And so in this time, what we're going to see here is we're going to be introduced to a, several groups of people. And I want to take some time and just focus on them as we meet them. You know, if you are a Christian, people or your business. It is what we are supposed to be focused on. And so when I read Scripture, one of the things I'm always interested in is seeing what kind of people we're being introduced to. First, we meet Jesus. This is King Jesus. This is the one who the whole story is about. And he is getting ready to come in to uh, Jerusalem. He already knows what's going to happen. We, we have an entire uh, story about him, and he makes this simple command about how he's going to go from one place to the other. And in verse 6, we meet our first group of people. It says this, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Jesus walking with his disciples and the disciples are people who knew Jesus well. These are the guys who walked with Jesus, who were called by Jesus, even out of their professions, right, to go from being fishermen to fishers of men. These are men who are not perfect, who still have a whole lot of things to learn and are going to mess up here really shortly pretty bad. These are the same men who are going to find redemption and recovery in Jesus. They're going to plant the church that leads to what we're doing today. These are people who knew Jesus well. See, and people who know Jesus well, when Jesus asks us to do things, it's automatic. It was automatic for the disciples to do what Jesus said. They'd gotten used to his ways, and while well, not perfect, they were obedient to him. And for these guys, I think it probably took very little effort for them to go into town and ask strangers for things. They've gotten used to that. Remember who Jesus is at this point. He's not a rich guy. He's actually homeless. He has no place to stay. So they're used to asking for food or a place to stay. They ask things for things like a donkey, a room to meet, food. They'd been following Jesus at this point for almost three years, and they're still going to mess up. But these are the guys who show up and follow Jesus. They know him well. This reminds me of Jason. Jason is our first elder at Forge Christian Church. Jason is actually preaching right now at Forge. This will be his second time preaching. Jason was one of the very first guys who jumped on board with us as we were trying to plant the church. My wife and I moved to Hastings with nobody else to start the church with. Jason had gone to church a lot of his life. He had uh, gone to uh, church in Omaha and moved down here. He was going to Third City, and when we got there in Third City, sent out a thing that said there's a church going in in Hastings, and so if you're down in that area, we encourage you to jump in. Jason is the only one, <laughs> unfortunately. Jason's the only one that contacted us, and the first time I met Jason was at a, the car races. Not, not a great place to have a meeting. It's very loud. Somehow... We were able to communicate, and I told him about the vision of Forge Christian Church, and it didn't take a lot of convincing Jason was in. We ordained Jason as our first elder on one of our first birthdays, and Jason has been a guy who has been my second-hand dude. Uh, I said in the morning, I am not a details guy. I'm just not. That's not, I don't care about the details. Jason is my details guy. So when we get going, and, and I... I have a vision, we talk about it. Jason's the guy who says, okay, well, what's that going to cost? Who's going to do that? Do we got to call insurance? He sells insurance, and so that's his mindset. Jason is a disciple. Jason is the guy who isn't perfect, for sure, who messes up. But he's the guy that when I asked him, 
not very long ago to preach today so that I could come up here and be with you guys? He said yes. This is what a disciple looks like. And we're introduced to these guys in the very first group of people. I think a lot of us like to identify as these guys. But we're going to keep going and see if, if who else we, we see here. Now, interesting here, too, as well, we are introduced almost in the same verse to another group of people. Verse 8, it says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The next group of people that we see in our scripture here are people who know of Jesus. These are people like the guy that lent his cult and the, the people that shouted. See, these are people who maybe grew up in the culture of Judaism. They knew the stories. They knew the scriptures. They had read the scriptures, memorized them, but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. These were guys who knew about God. I think there's a lot of people in our culture today that fall into this category. See, so you have a lot of images of Jesus or have heard or maybe have gone to church once or twice. They know about who God is, but the relationship with Jesus is far, far away. The cult lender is a guy who lends his donkey because he knows Scripture. He knows that the Messiah is prophesied to ride in on a donkey, and how exciting for this guy. He hears what's going on. He kind of hears maybe the reputation of Jesus. He's a teacher, and now he's asking for a donkey to ride in on. How amazing is it for this guy? Because now, guess what? The Messiah is going to ride into town on my donkey. After this, he's going to be able to go to his neighbors around coffee and say, yeah, how was your week? That's pretty good. Messiah rode in on my colt. It's not a big deal. Kind of like being camper of the week four times in a row, only one to ever do it. Not a, not a huge deal. <laughs> truth, absolute truth, not a big deal. This guy allows this to happen because he knows about Scripture. He doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't follow Jesus. But he's excited to be a part of kind of this story because, I mean, that's a really cool thing. Messiah gets to ride on, on my livestock. I mean, I'll bet afterwards, too, that livestock, he, he treated probably that donkey amazing, right? He brushed its hair, didn't beat it. It's like, you are, you are a special donkey. But ultimately, it's self-centeredness. Jesus was able to gain him something, recognition even secondhand, because this was my cult. This was my thing that happened around him peripherally. He knew about God, but he did not know Jesus. We see the people who shout and lay down clothes and palm branches for Jesus. The same goes for these people. They knew Scripture. They had a very shallow understanding of what the Messiah would be, this idea that he would fulfill the law that they had read about, that he was going to come into town and they see an image of a king, although he didn't really look like a king. He looked kind of homeless. But he was on a donkey, like Scripture said, and he was walking in. He had followers, and so they knew what they were supposed to do. So they laid down their, their clothes. They laid down palm branches. They shouted the right things. But this crowd, this same crowd who shout Hosanna, would soon shout, crucify him. See, when the real Jesus, when King Jesus does not conform to what their idea of a king should be, they pulled up their dust-covered clothes and exchanged them for metaphorical pitchforks and torches, but literally sided with a convicted murder over the one they once called blessed. See, they knew about God. They didn't know who Jesus was. There was no relationship with the Christ, with the Messiah, with a King Jesus. They liked the excitement of what was going on in the day. They liked being there and shouting and being part of a crowd that said, yes, this man is blessed, and look, he's doing what Scripture says. But when it came time to pick sides, they didn't pick Jesus. They picked probably the furthest 
away from Jesus. Such a contrast of people. So I think there's a lot of people that fall into this category where they think they know about what God wants or who God is, but when God calls them to something difficult, when God calls them to make a real choice to either be all in or all out, they run away. Because it's hard to stand in front of a crowd chanting crucify him and do something different. It's hard to live contrary to what the people around you are living That's why Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it's not going to be fun. He says, pick up your cross and die daily. Can you die to yourself? Can you count the cost? That is why when a rich young ruler comes to follow Jesus, he says, sell everything, give it to the poor, and come be homeless with me. Now, I'm in church planning business. If a rich person shows up at Forge and says, I want to be a part of the church, That's a huge, that's exciting, right? You're like, yes, and tithe is mandatory, so I'll take that check right now. (laughs) Up front, first and last months, right? We get excited that Jesus sees past the pocketbook. He sees past the talent and the ability. He sees in the heart of a man. He says, if you want to follow me, you've got to be willing to follow me under the worst conditions possible. Are you relying on me? or what's in your pockets, or what's in your head, or your hands? Are you willing to follow me, and the real me, and let me be king, and you be a follower and a servant, or are you just excited? Because there's excitement going on. This group of people lay down clothes and shout, blessed is he, but they soon fall away. Verse 10 says this, it says, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. They shout his name. and They have no idea who he is. Verse 12, it tells us that Jesus entered the temple courts. And he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Jesus says, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This is the third people group that we see. Now, before we just dump on this group, which is so easy to do, right, in in sermons and, and we talk about this, before we just dump all over this group, I want to just take a minute and and consider the following. These are the people that kept the temple running. Understand, these are the people that show up every day to do the work that nobody else is qualified to do. And even this practice that, that Jesus kicks everybody out for began very differently. The changing of money and selling was not in and of itself, this evil thing. But instead, it was a a service. What a blessing it was for people coming from miles around to be able to show up and not have to bring livestock for hundreds of miles to be able to come to the temple and sacrifice that. But instead, it's so much easier to carry a bag of money Purchase an already good to go, ready to be sacrificed animal. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to bring large bills with you, bills, and break them down at the temple to be able to spend while you're in town. This was a service. This was a thing that they did in order to serve people. The priests and the Pharisees began this process in order to serve the people of their nation so that they could worship easier. See, this wasn't necessarily a bad thing when it started. The heart behind it was how can we make this easy for people, accessible for people to worship. It was about convenience. But see, I think that became the issue. Convenience became the goal, became the focus. Selfishness then soon found its way at the centerpiece of the table that was table that was once meant for selflessness. See, now no longer was it just good enough 
to buy and sell animals so that people could worship easier, but instead it became about profit. Well, my time is worth something. My effort is worth something. See, then it became about extortion with an emphasis on theological implications because if you don't do this, then God is not with you. Then you are unclean. That animal that you brought is not good enough. You must buy one of these, and in fact, I'll even buy that one from you from a discount, and then I'll put it back in the rotation. See, it became so much more about me and my wealth. And so the people that knew of God were used by the people who taught about God all without knowing who God was. See, this day that happens here, for the people in the temple, for these Pharisees, for these money changers, this was a very difficult day. And it wasn't difficult because they had a hard time following what Jesus said, but it was difficult because they had no interest in following what Jesus said. They had no interest in doing what God wanted them to do, but instead, it was difficult because their selfishness was ruined. It was difficult because Jesus worked directly against them. It's where James tells us that God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. God actively works against them here. The God they claim to know and serve was in direct opposition to them. That's a very difficult day. And Jesus finds this group of people the ones who taught about God and still didn't know about God or who God was. And it tells us that he kicks them out of the temple. And then in verse 14, we're introduced to our last group. It says this, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple. And he healed them. But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They said, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him, yes. Jesus replied, have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. These are the people who dare not enter the temple. These are people who are outcasts, who are deemed less than by society because of physical ailments, mental ailments, bad choices, circumstances that have all kept them outside of the steps just hoping for some leftovers. But King Jesus claims his rightful place in the center of the temple. And he begins to bring them inside with him. Notice, it is only after the others were driven out, expelled, dismissed, kicked out, that this group could come in. See, the temple was filled with gatekeepers. Those who decided who was worthy enough to walk through the doors. Those who decided whether you were clean or unclean. Those who decided whether you would defile the assembly and cause a whole lot of inconvenience for other people. So you stay outside. We'll stay in here. And if, by some chance, some miracle, you get it together, if, by some chance, you get fixed, if you get over that thing, then upon close examination, we will allow you the chance to get right with God for a price. 
And it wasn't until King Jesus turned over the tables, drove out that cancer like light, drives away darkness, that we see miracles begin to happen. Blind men stumbled their way to Jesus. And they left with new vision. Lame men crawled and clawed their way to the Savior and stood up and walked in a newness of life. Miracles happen when King Jesus is in the temple. In fact, verse 15 tells us that that even the ones that were expelled, the ones that were kicked out, saw wonderful things happening. They witnessed the miracles that happened inside the temple where the unclean stood and King Jesus reigned and they were enraged. Hearing children proclaim God the same things that the crowd had done earlier, they became upset because they couldn't see King Jesus. They only saw themselves. This day, the middle of the temple was life-changing for this group of people. When we started Forge, as I was recruiting, I said Jason was our first one. There was another girl that uh, was in college that started with us. We're going to call her Cat. Cat jumped on board very early, and she was running a lot of my sound stuff, my tech stuff, um, helping me get the website going. And we were working. Cat is one of these people who grew up in church. Uh, she knew a lot about who God was. We began soft launch in October of 2018, and the third Sunday that we had service in October, I get a call at 4 o'clock in the morning, and it's Kat, and she is drunk, and her friend is in the hospital because she had overdosed on alcohol, and she's confessing to me the things that are going on, and I had a, a very difficult decision to make. What do I do? This is my third Sunday as a new church plant before we've even grand opened, and one of my core team members is wasted. One of the things we have on our sign, one of the hearts of Forge Christian Church is this idea that you can come as you are. And I was slapped in the face with the reality of what I had set before us. Do I mean that? Do I mean that these people can come as they are? And so I told her, I said, I'll put some coffee on. You get here, we'll get you sobered up. We got service in a few hours. That morning, Kat ran our slides in the back with a trash can next to her, pressing the slide button and throwing up in the bucket. (laughs) She stayed. I gave her a card the next week with a gift card to a coffee shop in town, and I told her, I'm not giving you this because I'm proud of the decisions you've made last week. But I want you to know one thing. I'm proud of you because you could have ran away. You didn't have to be here. You could have slunk away because of the decisions you have made, but you chose to show up, and that needs to be celebrated. That we love you where you are, and you don't have to pretend to be a good church girl that you're not. And the next week, two more of her friends showed up. And her other friend became one of our worship leaders. Another one of her friends helped with our children's ministry. Because I had the decision to make about what I believed, about who Jesus was after. That same month, another lady showed up. We're going to call her B. B. Was in a rough period of her life. She was in active addiction. She had just had a baby that had been taken away by CPS because of her addiction. And her caseworker happened to be coming to our church at the time. Her caseworker invited her to come with her on a Sunday. And so B decided that in order to win extra points with her caseworker, she would go wherever she wanted her to go. 
If that meant church, then she would show up. But B knew that she couldn't do that sober. So the first time B shows up to church service, she was high on meth. And she sat in the back with her caseworker, trying to pay attention and trying to keep it together so that nobody would know what was going on. And she heard us talk about Jesus. She heard us talk about being able to come as you are and about this great king who loves you right now and loves the real you. Not the one you pretend to be here, but the one that you really are. And that's the one he wanted, the one that he wanted to use and transform. And she went home. She came back the next week. And the next week, and the next week, and she came back the first time without her caseworker. And I was very shocked, to be honest with you. I didn't expect to see her there on her own. She began to bring her boyfriend at the time with her. She entered into a place that said they loved people as they were and found truth there. She met King Jesus, not the one that she had heard about growing up, but the one that's written about, the one that is real, the one that kicks out those that are fake and calls those that are unclean and heals them. She met the one that changed her life. We got to baptize her. In Lake Hastings, one summer, about two years ago, and a people from our church showed up. The foster parents that were taking care of her baby showed up. In fact, the director of Nexus, Phil Claycomb, happened to be in town that day. And we got to witness her accept Jesus into her life. And to this point, she struggled. She still has ups and downs, dealt with relapse. But she has brought more people to Forge Christian Church than anybody else. She's invited more of her friends that are far from God to come sit with her in our sanctuary to hear about who Jesus is more than any other person that has come to forge. She works deeply in the recovery community and she hears people talk about us even if they haven't walked the doors yet because they've heard her story and others like her. We have baptized the first person at a Revive who has been around for 13 years. We baptized the first person from their program during the shutdown. And like I said, it's not here to brag. But it's here to tell you about the power of the real King Jesus. So I ask you this morning... How hard was it for you to come here today? For some of you, maybe all you needed was a strong cup of coffee to get going. For some of you, you may need a little more. For some of you who have been in church for a long time, it's automatic. Because this is what you do. You're used to it. But understand that there are people that have a huge journey from their car, through those doors, into this place. And we cannot be gatekeepers. Is Jesus in the temple? And I do not mean this building. For the New Testament tells us that we are the temple that the Holy Spirit resides in. For you are the temple. Is Jesus in the temple? The Bible tells us that the, the sick do, the healthy do not need a doctor, but the sick do. We are called to be a hospital. And I'm sure you guys probably heard that if you've been in church a long time. The church is supposed to be a hospital. But you know what's interesting? Even in a hospital, there's a room called the staff lounge. It's where the staff goes to rest, to recover. I wonder if we're living in the lounge sometimes in the middle of a hospital. When's the last time we made our way out to the ER? When's the last time we journeyed outside of our convenience and we went after those that can't walk or see? Those that can't believe that somebody in here wants them in here. 
I don't know how hard it was for you today, but I, tell, I guarantee you there's somebody out there that wanted to be here. And unless we go after them, unless we get rid of all the facade, get rid of all the whitewash, and begin to follow the real Jesus, we're just money changing. The invitation today is not for you to come up and, and, and give your life to Christ necessarily. We'll do that. If you need to do that, there'll be somebody up here. My invitation for you today is I invite you to ministry with us. I invite you to get involved with ministry here at Ord, real ministry, ministry to the lost and the broken, the blind and the lame, the sick and the hurt, the down and out, the ones. They're just begging for scraps. What a wonderful time we get now to go and fellowship together as a church, as a kingdom-wide church. And I'm going to pray for us. And I'm going to pray for our meal. And we're going to be done in this time. But the work isn't over. Church isn't over. For you are the church. You are the ministry that exists here. So let's go get it. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the chance to come before you and hear your words. I thank you that you are a God who seeks us, the lowly, the broken, the ones that don't deserve, the ones that need a Savior. Father, let us never forget how desperate we need you. Father, I pray for our meal time as we get ready to leave that you bless the food, and that you bless our fellowship together. God, and maybe there's some, some of us here this morning that we just need an alignment. Maybe we have made this place too much about convenience or ourselves, and we have forgotten about those people. Allow us to make the adjustments back. God, get us excited about the miracles that you want to happen. And Father, let us not just know about you this morning. Father, let us know you. I pray all of these things in your mighty name. Amen. You guys are dismissed and have a wonderful lunch. <laughs>